tiny part about one tiny corner of, of what he talked about. And um, I, want you, I want everything that I say to be understandable. So I want you to interrupt me and stop me if something is unclear and elaborate. I, don't ha I have five lectures. I don't have to get through a lot. So we just have a discussion for 90 minutes. It's also OK. Um, so please stop me. And also, uh, um, I think I'm speaking loud enough you can hear me in the back, right? I'm not writing big enough so you can read it in the back, but I will try from now on to write big enough so you can read it in the back. Um, so really, I have five lectures, OK? At least that's the plan. With lecture five, is still a little bit open-ended to see how far we get. So in the first lecture, I'll call it, um, is entitled Harmony, since you won't be able to read it in the back, OK? Um, and that's really all about how to define a logic. How do we define a logic? Um, and this work in the first lecture goes back to um, Gensen's work in 35 that Bob already mentioned. Michael Dummett had a very influential series of lectures and paper in 1976. And Martin Leff had a very influential paper, paper in 83. So it's really about those three papers that the first lecture is about. Um, then in the second lecture, um, which is entitled Proofs as Programs, I will talk again about a small corner of the big picture that Bob drew. And um, we'll talk about how to compute in logic. So we go from pure logical reasoning, which will be the first lecture, to actual computation and the connection to programming languages. Then in the third lecture, we'll talk about the sequent calculus, which also was invented by Gensen for, for a very specific purpose. He wanted not to only define logic, which he actually did, with inference rules, which are natural deduction, but he also developed techniques for reasoning about the logic. Okay, not reasoning within, but proving properties of the logic. And for that purpose, he introduced the sequent calculus, which is also very important from the computational perspective. It's also very important to understand properties of logical systems. So I would, say this, the, would say the first three lectures are sort of the core of what I'm trying to get across. Um, and then we'll come to um, two more topics, which are more my current uh, area of research, but I think you'll also find it interesting. So the fourth lecture will be on linear logic, and the subtitle of that truth is ephemeral. Okay. So it's a very uh, um, unusual point of view of logic, which Girard introduced in 86. And then we'll talk about the computation and interpretation of linear logic. And here, rather than proofs as programs, we could have still said that. But here, the interpretation is proofs as processes. So if you want to get a good logical handle on understanding concurrent computation, then you need linear logic, and I'll lay out how that works. Okay. Um, but the lectures four and five, we'll see how far we get. Um, and I'm willing to go as slow as necessary and cut material if, if needed. Okay. So, um, so let's start at the beginning. So what is logic actually? Okay, what do we study in logic? So let me put it here. So logic is a study, the laws governing valid inference. Okay, and the emphasis here is on inference. So we often say, oh, this is true and that is true. But in some sense, we are not really concerned in logic about what is true and what's not true. You might say that's philosophy in general. What we're really interested in is when you can infer something from something you already know, or when you're allowed to conclude something. So how do you do inferences in a valid way? That's what we study in logic. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay, so, uh, so again, this goes back to a famous uh, sort of logical puzzles. Okay, so um, we'll have one sentence. Okay, is this readable in the back? Doing okay? Okay, so Helen is a woman. Okay, that's my first statement. I'm talking about Helen of Troy, okay? And the second one is all women are mortal. Okay, and you could probably supply the third line, 
Okay. Therefore, okay, Helen is mortal. Okay, so one thing we can ask here is whether the deduction from these two lines to that point to that third line is a valid deduction. But we're still talking about very concrete sentences. We're talking about Helen of Troy, we're talking about mortality, and so on. That's not really what logic is about. If we talk about this in logic, we'll first abstract over this. We write it in a formal language, and we reason within that formal language. Okay, so the first step would be something like, okay, we introduce a predicate. So for example, saying Helen is a woman, okay. Then all women are mortal, I would say something like for every x, if x is a woman, that implies that um, x is mortal. And then here I would con conclude that mortal of Helen. Okay, so now at this point I've really translated these informal linguistic statements in natural language into some kind of a formal language, but I haven't really reached logic yet in some sense because this still talks about Helen of Troy. I have introduced some logical symbols, but I'm still talking about very concrete objects. So what I really study in logic is the, quest is the following question. If I have some kind of a proposition here, P of some constant C, so I abstract away from being a woman and the constant C. And here I say that for every x, um, if P of x implies Q of x, can I conclude that Q holds off the constant C? Okay, so when we actually talk about reasoning, when I talk to you about how to define the logic, we don't talk about this thing, we don't talk about this thing, but what we really talk about is at this level of abstraction, where P and Q are arbitrary propositions, X is some quantified variable, C is some kind of a constant that we can talk about in our propositions, okay? Does that make sense? Is there any question about this? Okay, so but in logic we can ask if that deduction from these two, and we draw a line between this, if you know this and we know that, can we conclude that? Okay, and then this might be a concrete interpretation of that with some specific predicates, and there might be just a, a natural language sort of rendering of the same argument. So we're asking if that proposition, that in, uh, form of reasoning here is valid. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so the, the next question is, why am I going through a lot of trouble to actually spend a whole lecture on talking to you about how to define a logic? So um, some model is that, well, 1935, or maybe in the ancient Greek time, somebody defined logic. So we know what logic is. We don't have to define it anymore. We're done, okay? But that's actually not the case, because there's many, many different logics that people actually consider. And it's really important for computer science to consider the different logics. And here's why, okay? Um, Okay, so the reason is because on the logical side, different logics cover different modalities of truth, okay? And we formulate this, and well, I'll explain a little bit later in the lecture with the notion of a judgment. So we have some kind of a judgment here. Okay, so the, the basic judgment that we're talking about is that some proposition A is true. Okay, so for example, instead of writing just P of C, if we're being particular, we would say if P of C is true, and it's true that this implies that, can we conclude that Q of C is true? And then these things become proposition, and we're talking about whether propositions are true. If you just do that, okay, so this usually corresponds to, um, let me write it in the middle here. Um, we get something called intuitionistic logic intuitionistic logic. And we know, so this is logic, and we know that computationally, what does it correspond, intuitionistic logic corresponds to? 
I think Bob mentioned in his lecture, but it's pretty, pretty obvious. Lambda calculus, right? Or if you want to put another term, more generic term on it, functional programming. Okay, so intuitionistic logic corresponds to functional program, which we'll see in the second lecture. Okay, now we could consider different judgment as well. We could consider A is true and A is false. And if we do that in a certain way, that gives us classical logic. And then there's a question here where that is a valid computational interpretation of that. Okay, um, so I don't want to spend time discussing that. But there's many other judgments we could make. For example, we could make a judgment that A is valid. Okay. So what does validity of A mean? Uh, validity of A means that the uh, proposition is true no matter what. Okay. Um, so the truth of a proposition usually may be contingent upon the world that we are in. For example, it's true that right now I'm holding this marker. When once I put it down, of course, it's no longer true which we'll come to in lecture four because truth is ephemeral, okay? Validity is not ephemeral, okay? Once something is valid, it's supposed to be true under every, every possible interpretation. And if we do that, then we get something called modal logic. And there's a whole bunch of different computational interpretations of modal logic. For example, it can refer to stage computation. It could refer to runtime cogeneration, um, and so on. So there's many different ways of interpreting that. And there's more here. Um, I'd say, I'm gonna ask you for homework to do that. Um, to define the judgment A is true at time t and the propositions that go along with that. Um, and so this is going to correspond to something called temporal logic, that's not surprising. And I'm not gonna give away this, okay? Because hopefully, after three lectures, you can arrive where that should be, okay? So there's a computation interpretation of temporal logic, and it's pretty interesting, okay? Um, okay, or we can have A is true in world. W, that gives us another form of modal logic. And so here we could have, for example, distributed computation. So the world W is where something is being computed, and the laws presumably of logic tell you how to plug these things together in the correct way, and so you get a model of you know, distributed computation. And then in the lecture four, we'll talk about A, it's ephemeral, so it's true, but only sort of in a certain, at, at the current point, if you want, or in a certain world, um, but abstracting away from the world is, and if you do that the right way, we get linear logic, and then if you do that, we get concurrent computation. So all these logic have been considered before, they don't originate in computer science. Okay, they originate in logic and philosophy because people were trying to capture different phenomena. Um, for example, the fact that true isn't always the same, it's different in different worlds, or the truth might change with time. Um, and now we can apply these ideas, however, to computer science and see what are the computational consequences of taking that point of view. Now in order to be able to play this out in the right way, we need to understand what are the basic principles that guide how we define the logic so we do it the right way. Because if you look at the literature and you look at all of these, you'll find it's not directly useful to computer science. The basic ideas aren't, but the particular way that they define the logical systems and the way that they think about, about these logics doesn't really help that much. Um, so we really need to go back to the basics and figure out how do we define the logic and then once you figure out what kind of logic we want to describe, we use these internal laws um, and how to define a logic, then it's obvious well, after this lecture, I hope, how to define temporal logic. And then you can look at it and see, well, how do we compute? What is our computational mechanism that corresponds to temporal logic?
and you get some interesting new programming language that you didn't think about before. Okay? So that's what this, what, uh, that's why it's so worthwhile spending a lot of effort on defining logics, yeah? Okay, so A false would be, um, how would you define the, tr the truth of not A? When is not A true? Okay, so in intuitionistic logic, there's one way to define it, but there's another way to define it, which you could say not A is true if A is false. So you mean that classical logic can be encoded in intuitionistic logic? Um, well, that's also true, but that's what I was getting at. What I was getting at, if I follow the prescription of how to define logics that I'm going to lay out today, okay, then it's difficult to find classical logic, okay, because um, you will see that it sort of inevitably end up with intuitionistic logic. And so you can ask, well, what's missing? Why not classical logic? Right? Why don't you get out classical logic? And the answer to that is that you need a second judgment, which is that, that A is false. Okay, and we define truth and falsehood at the same time in a symmetric way. And if you do that, then you get classical logic. Okay? I don't know if that helps, but maybe at the end of the lecture it might be more clear. Okay. Okay. Yeah? Computation here is not necessarily determinate. Um, okay, so... Okay, so if you take a purely logical point of view, so if you start with a pure logical system, computation will always terminate. And equations will be a consequence of computation, but they're not the first thing. So if you think about that triangle there, if you, if you look at the categorical side, the equations are paramount. On the proof theory side, the equations are not the first thing that comes to mind, but it turns out that there's a natural notion of computation that arises from the proof theoretic study of the meaning of propositions. And then you can use that in order to define how to compute. Okay. So, yes. So then if you want non-terminating computations, then you have to think about how to accommodate that. That's a separate topic. Yeah? Are there corresponding structures or uh, ideas uh, in category theory that kind of relate to each of these judgments? Yes, they are. Um, I'm not sure that all of them have been looked at you know, equally carefully. Um, certainly, there's categorical structures here, 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 and here. Um, I'm not sure completely about the temporal part if people have looked at that. Yes. So the triangle holds, okay, as far as we know, okay. Okay, so let's dive in, okay. Okay, so. Um, I'll put this. I'll put this over here because, okay. Okay, so the, um, the big question is what, is what determines the meaning of a proposition? Okay, so there's basically, um, there's many ways you could define that, but I think in principle there's two different ways that people have tried to define that. So one is what you call the Tarskian way, which is you describe the notion of a model, and then you talk about the interpretations of the formulas in this model. Okay? And that requires that you already understand the structure of models and mathematics. You want to use logic as a foundation for mathematics, that's kind of a circular thing, because the models have already to be there before you actually even talk about them. Okay? So there's another way, which is taking the proofs as a primary thing. Okay? And sometimes it's described as a proof theoretic semantics. And what Martin Leff says, okay, so this is Martin Leff, not, mach not machine learning, okay, and, and not ML as a programming language, okay. All right. Um, so the meaning of a proposition. is determined by 
what counts as a verification of it. And for the purpose of today's lecture, okay, instead of verification, let's just substitute the word proof. Um, in the second, in the third lecture, maybe, I can talk to you about the difference between the two, between verification and proof. I don't think I have time to talk to you about it today. So just think about it for now. The meaning of a proposition is determined by what's count as a proof of the proposition. Okay? So, for example, if I want to define you um, when a conjunction is true, okay, so this is, so when is A and B true? By the way, if I write this, I never write parentheses, but this true applies to everything that's in front of it. Okay? And when I write conjunction between A and B, I assume that conjunction is a constructor for propositions out of propositions. So that this whole thing here is a proposition, and this is a judgment about the proposition. And we see over there, there are other judgment today, only truth, okay, to make things simple. Okay, so when is A and B true? The way I'm going to define that is I'm going to say that, okay, it's going to be like that. And I'm going to name the inference rule, and I call it ant introduction, okay, following, following Genson. Okay, so I'm not going to write this just as an inference rule, but I want you to view this as a definition of what conjunction is. Okay, do you understand the difference? Okay, in one point of view it is, oh, well, if A is true and B is true, then the conjunction must be true. Okay, I'm actually looking at it differently. For A and B, A and B to be true, okay, there must be...